Amen. So you are faced with a dilemma to either come to the majesty of Christmas at three or at five. That's your great dilemma today. Now, normally a dilemma is choosing between two opposing, equally undesirable choices. Those are two really good choices, by the way. And I do hope that you'll be here today. It's going to be an amazing time. And there's still time. This is why we do this, to invite friends to come and join you. Just call someone, text someone, tell them you'll come by and pick them up. Take them out to dinner afterwards. This is a great opportunity that may come, you know, every so often where people are more apt to come to Christmas on a, on a day like this. So we're glad that you're here today. And we welcome everybody, all of you who are guests. We're worshiping the Lord. I've been all over our campus this morning. And it is amazing what God is doing in our church in these days. And all of you guests, we're glad that you're here. Hope I get to meet you today before you go. And everyone online, we welcome you. You can go ahead and turn to the book of Matthew. We're going to dive in back into the story. I'm going to set it up. We'll be in the first chapter, by the way. But uh, Sidney Harris, he was a columnist and an author back in the mid-late 1900s. Um, That was a long time ago, by the way. Um, And he wrote a book called The Authentic Person. Uh, The subtitle of the book was Dealing with Dilemma. Today we're going to talk about facing dilemmas. Uh, He said formally, think about this, this it's like 50, 60 years ago when he actually wrote this. Um, He said formally, back in the day, we had a real profound sense of identity because of permanence and continuity. He says, now we live, and how about this, even more so today, we live now in, in in a constant state of change. So he says, here's the dilemma. The dilemma is, our dilemma is that we hate change, he writes, and love it at the same time. We really, what we really want is for things to remain the same, but get better. Isn't that right? Really, we all want that. This is the dilemma that we live in. But have you ever heard, you've heard the phrase perhaps, um, you're caught in a horned dilemma. Do you know this phrase? Um, It actually goes back to a 16th century, I did my research, um, idiom that's from the Latin, which means horned argument. The idea is that you're caught between two horns, like of a bull, and you're trying to avoid one horn and then you're impaled by the other. You're caught in a dilemma. There's no good choice either way. Have you ever faced that in your life? I can tell you if you, we all have. We may not call them that. They're they're called paradoxes in the kingdom of God. We live in those tensions. But what I've learned, um, gosh, not only through the past few years, how about that? In terms of leadership, there's oftentimes you're making decisions and you go into them knowing this is not going to go well. Either way we go here, this is going to be challenging, but we don't have another option. Many of you know the story of Joseph that we find in Matthew 1. He is faced with a dilemma. And this this topic is so important for us because... Uh, I see it in Christian circles, and I think we as believers need to show the world how to live in, often, dilemmas, how to live in nuances. We tend to to polarize and to run from one thing to another, but we must remain in tension sometimes, as we'll see today, as we trust the Lord with things that we cannot fully see or understand. How do we deal with dilemmas in our lives? Jesus calls us to remain in the world, but not be of the world. It's a dilemma. We're called to be light in the darkness. Light shines in the darkness, not in the light. So we're called to be servants of all. This is how we influence others. There's all kinds of paradoxes. We want to be generous givers of our time and our resources, but we also want to be prudent and financially secure. We hope to avoid one horn and we're impaled by the other. Joseph finds himself in such a dilemma. Joseph is, is of course chosen to be the father, earthly father, the adoptive father of Jesus. And what we're gonna see in this passage, Matthew one, we're gonna start in verse 18, 18 through 25. We're gonna see Joseph's disappointment. Uh, We're gonna see his dilemma. We're gonna unpack that a bit. And then we're gonna see his decision and draw application for ourselves. If you've been with us uh, throughout this series and throughout the month, we're looking at different people who were in the big story of God, who were invited into the story. 
And, and that's really where all of this runs. Each of us have been invited into a story where we actually find ourselves instead of losing ourselves in our own story. And so Joseph is brought in. Philip Yancey uh, writes that we are the visited planet. We're the ones to whom God has come. And last week we looked at Mary who grew up in this close-knit Jewish community and how her life was completely disrupted, how she uh, traded her worries for worship. And we're going to see in many ways their stories are similar, right? You can't separate Mary and Joseph. God, God called each of them and yet together and for a lot of the same reasons. Today we're going to look at Matthew, not Luke. Matthew focuses on uh, showing that Jesus is the Messiah. He really has, uh, has a Jewish kind of audience in mind, but he's focusing on how Christ has become the Messiah, the liberating king. How God became king is the focus of Matthew. And with that in mind, after we see the genealogy of Jesus in verse 18, he writes this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, this single verse, this is the way scripture goes, is loaded with context, even historical understanding that we need to unpack a bit. It's loaded with meaning. Mary and Joseph are engaged. It says they're betrothed, betrothed. Uh, and it doesn't mean exactly what it does in our day. See, nowadays, you, you, you can just go tell people we're getting married or how hard they have any planning at all right nowadays you can post it on social media and they're like oh they're committed now that's happening evidently right often there's a ring involved not always but often at least that's a sign of commitment but back in the day you you may know this in first century judaism radically different now we as christians still follow the same judeo-christian approach and focus on marriage you may know let me just offer this parenthetically that here in our church we take marriage very seriously. We take singleness very seriously because we're all called to holiness, to be like Jesus, every one of us, married or not. But when it comes to marriage, we want people to prepare for marriage. So we have a nearly wed ministry. You may know this, it's been going on for decades now. It is incredible. Always be on the lookout, sharing with others that we are here to prepare you, young couples, for marriage in our nearly wed program, which is incredible. We also have a newly wed class to help them as they get their feet on the ground their first year of marriage. And I say all of this because a betrothal in the first century was taken very seriously and just as we are taking it seriously in our day because not everyone does. I'll always stand in a wedding before the couple and before everyone there and say this couple has prepared not just for this beautiful wedding, they've prepared for marriage. And here's what they have done to do so. Many people are spending more time focused on the venue and the wedding than they are intensive focus on the marriage. So in the first century, you may know that being betrothed was actually judicially, uh, financially binding. The father of the groom would actually give a dowry to the bride and to the family in case something were to happen. You may know, you probably know, reading scripture, that in the first century, women were very vulnerable in many ways. It's why we're called, even still, to care for widows and for orphans and for those who are single women. Back in the day in this paternalistic society, um, we saw that, gosh, to be a divorced woman or to not have a father, the father essentially... Uh, owned the daughter, if you will. She was under the guidance, protection of the father. So much so that we see that any damages that, that were incurred, any injuries done to a daughter, uh, uh, this is Exodus 21, any slander to her good name, Deuteronomy 22, or even for her seduction, Exodus 22, they were all demandable punishment by the father. This was the law. And living in, in close Jewish communities like Nazareth, the couple, of course, would have never lived together. They would never have cohabitated beforehand. And to find out that she's pregnant would have just shaken Joseph to the core. He does not yet know what we know, that it is an immaculate conception, right? 
So this even could be brought about in the, in the Jewish community. It was formally met with the capital punishment, stoning. Now, Romans were, were the ones who had power over whether capital punishment would take place. So likely, more likely, she's going to be completely ostracized by her family and by the community, and he would be as well. So the common practice was for, listen to this, for the groom to take his bride, okay, if he lived outside of, of the community, which was rare, but if he did, he would come back to his father's house. That was often the case. They would work together. And he would uh, then build this, this annex, like a bridal chamber. There would be a year-long preparation. If he lived elsewhere, he would come uh, back to, to prepare go back to wherever he lived and unknowingly to the bride or anyone there, he would come back. They would not know the time that the groom would return and he would come fetch his bride and then they'd enter into the process of getting married. Even today, if you have Jewish friends, there's there's a long process in getting ready for the wedding. And even then, the day of the wedding, the, the bride will enter into the mikvah, which is like a baptistry into spiritual cleansing. There's a preparation of time. Often uh, Orthodox Jews are separated from one another for a period of time because the, the holy moment that they've been waiting for, the moment when they stand under the chuppah, under the, maybe if you've been to a Jewish wedding, a structure that's built symbolizing now the new home, the new family that they are establishing before God Almighty in a commitment that they've made. They stand under the hoopah for the entire service. All of this because, as it is written, all for the reason that a man should leave his father and mother and find his wife and the two will become one flesh. One flesh. Oneness is the purpose of marriage. So, all of that background to say this. Let's consider Joseph's disappointment. First, he doesn't know that, that Jesus, I mean, that, that uh, Mary is pregnant with Jesus. Uh, you can imagine. He is distraught. He is brokenhearted. He loves Mary. Though these marriages often were put together, parents would be guiding the way, but surely he loved her. And we see this throughout his life, throughout the story, what we know of him. So how do you respond to disappointment? That's really the question I want to pause for a moment and consider, we know the rest of the story, but I want, I want you to consider how you respond to disappointments in your life. News that you didn't expect. We talked about this with Mary, but maybe you have been hurt. Presumably here, you've been hurt by someone that you thought would be faithful to you. We all have in varying degrees, and this can get real tender for some of us, particularly when We consider that all he could think was that she had been unfaithful to him. There's no other way (laughs) you get pregnant. And we can also assume here that Mary's the one who told him. And she says, I'm pregnant, but it's by the Holy Spirit. All he heard was the first part of that that statement. That's all he heard. And that's all that mattered. He immediately thought, what in the world? Now listen, perhaps you have felt the sting. And this can run deep of having been hurt by someone that you love. Again, we all have experienced that. Maybe you're walking through a season now. Maybe you need to process, uh, to move past some hurt that has come to you. And Christmas is a really good time to do that. Maybe it's an employer, an, an, an employee, a spouse, coworker, or a friend. Because here's the thing, we need to remember, no one has been more unfaithful to us than we have been to God. And Christmas reminds us that we all are in need of grace. Now, in this moment of the message, I wanna bring a real practical advice for us here. And if you're wrestling with this, and I think all of us in varying degrees, I want you to consider an acronym, REST, R-E-S-T. If you wanna write this down and and think about it as, as you process what you're going through, first reflect. I think we can see that Joseph must have done this. Reflect on the source of your anger, your disappointment. Uh, Do you understand fully why the person or the group, whoever it was that hurt you, do you really understand why they did that? What what part of it might you own? Does that person have a deep-seated sin that actually needs to be addressed, that has come out, and and, and in such a way that it's hurt you? So, So reflect, first of all. E, explore. Explore your own heart. Before you, you throw stones, what part did you play in the situation? 
And let's all own our part. S, seek out others that you can process this with. Before you enter into, um, into reaction or reciprocity or uh, revenge, instead, process with other godly people around you. And then finally, T, trust. So you can rest in the Lord. You can trust in him that he actually can give you grace in difficult moments and in the worst moments of your life. When you hear this kind of disruptive news, when you're disappointed and hurt by someone that you trusted, Jesus said that he who is without sin cast the first stone. We have no record of Joseph throwing rocks at all. We don't have him overreacting, but watch what he does as he processes this great disappointment. Look at verse 19. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to to divorce her quietly. Now, this is all we need to know about Joseph. He's a just man. And we know more than that, but he is a just man. He's a righteous man. We talked a lot about this in Proverbs. What was the distinction between a righteous person and an an unrighteous person? So there's a a nuance here. Some of you may know that that justice or being just and righteous are almost interchangeable words throughout the scriptures. The difference here is that righteousness is really, I, I could argue, is a personal trait. You want to do the right thing before God Almighty. Not what others might tell you, but you're going to obey him. That's a righteous person. One who is just is seeking to bring righteousness into relationships and into society. That's why we talk about uh, seeking justice, Micah 6, 8, uh, for others around us and in society. We see this in two passages where the, the righteous person is described. Psalm 1 and Jeremiah 17. We see it in other places, but these two passages are almost identical. In Jeremiah 17, 8, it describes the righteous person. Consider yourself, consider Joseph. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought for it does not cease to bear fruit. You see, Joseph's roots run deep is what we know about it. It's not like the disappointment comes or a dilemma comes and suddenly, what do I do? The righteous person is already on track to follow the Lord, whatever may come. So as we consider his disappointment, let's look now at his dilemma. Because even good men and women, we all face dilemmas. Did you catch it? Did you catch the dilemma? He's either going to really do what the law required. He's either going to divorce her publicly and shame her or do do something divorce her if you will end it privately and 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 save well actually save himself when he goes public with her and then save her by going privately neither are good options for him he's caught in this horn of dilemma neither are a win for him and he doesn't yet know in our passage that this is an immaculate conception again they had agreed upon that process of marriage and the entire community would have Now things are out of order. Now, let me chase a rabbit for just a moment to address a cultural misunderstanding that's being played out. You're seeing it in the news. It's played out in all kinds of issues today. And this Christmas story reminds us of how important this is. Mary and Joseph had decided, they determined, along with godly counsel, they're both righteous people. And we talked about how much Mary knew about the big story of God. Joseph did as well. And, and, and how they were brought together for a holy and, and, and a, a committed lifelong relationship in marriage. Marriage has taken a back seat in our day. And it's in part because of how we view the body and how God has created us as integrated people. You see, for the two to become one flesh, it's a merging of souls not just flesh. I remember when I was a kid thinking, and the two will become one flesh. I mean, I was in middle school probably, and I thought, flesh, oh, flesh. And I've seen pictures of Adam and Eve, and they were kind of fig leaf covered up in cartoons or my Bible in children's Bible. I thought, oh, flesh, oh, yeah, they're, they're, become, they're flesh. That's the, that's the sex part. That's, I get that. That's, but, but I've come to understand through the years, and then, no, 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 it's much more than that. But what's happened in our culture today There's a common belief, and it's just a new Gnosticism. 
Watch this. This is not new. A dualistic, polarized understanding of the body and the soul as being separated. God has created us in his image. We are integrated body and soul. And what we see is the Christian vision of the body is the highest view of the body that you're going to find anywhere. And what we're seeing is this emerging Gnosticism, which was a heresy in the first century. So you can imagine, think with me, the incarnation is the most scandalous thing that could happen. A Platonic, a Socratic view that says that the body is bad, soul is good. Instead, Jesus comes in the flesh. He takes on matter, biology, the body. And no wonder it's foolishness to the Greeks. No wonder it was a stumbling block to the Jews. You see, many people today say, I can do whatever I want to with my body because my mind and my body are separated. And in this battle of the mind and the body, now in that war, and it can be a war, the mind wins out. So now we're talking about personhood theory up against, right, the science of biological sex. Now this is really complicated for me just to focus in here for just a moment, but it's what's behind uh, hookup culture that whatever I do with my body, I can just remove my mind, try to just remove that and have a moment of pleasure. Um, and what we do is we disengender our bodies and we de dehumanize ourselves. When we take what God has created and we say, we're going to go our own way. Uh, one writer put it this way. I'm just a three pound brain guiding a meat skeleton. Another secular writer put it this way. We are just, you and I, humans are just a sack of meat. That's all we are. So if you remove the fact that we have been created by God and by his design, and we understand this Judeo-Christian version, uh, a vision of reframing, you see, intimacy, as the scripture tells us, we see the treasure of the relationship and a holistic approach to integrated humanhood. Now, I say all that because there are complicated issues here regarding our sexuality, and I understand that. But I'm speaking to all of us, single or married, that we can glorify God with our bodies. And it might mean for some of us that it means total abstinence in regard to sex for a lifetime. And we will, will show the world that God is enough and that we can glorify him with our bodies. So I wanted you to just to see how radically different a secular vision of the body and a Christian vision of the body, radically different. We can learn much from the first century, and I think that we do seek to God, be guided and, 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 and flourish in our sexuality, in our church, in our marriages, and in our singleness. But you can see the goal of every Jew was to stand under the hoopah, having waited until the moment where they could say yes to God and commit to him. This is where Mary and Joseph were. Now, for all of us, and we're all sexual sinners, by the way, for all of us who are, 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 are impure, you see, sexual purity is not a destination. We tell this to our students. Yes, you know, that's a goal. I mean, let's go. But sexual purity comes in a relationship. It's not a finish line. It's a relationship with the one who is pure. You follow me? None of us are pure apart from Christ. And so he's the one who purifies us completely. Joseph's only recourse here in his mind is do what the law required and publicly shame Mary or as a righteous man to say, I'll take the hit. We'll go quietly and this is not going to go well for me. So let's look at Joseph's decision. All right. As we land this, he's decided to divorce her privately. But look at verse 20. God does what he does with us. Don't miss this. God's going to rescue him from a poor decision. He's caught in the horns of dilemma. God's going to rescue him. Watch this. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear take, to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now notice it's a dream, not like Gabriel who appears to Mary. Personally, we're going to see dreams. Joseph had dreams. Every time God would speak to him, it, it was a dream. I mean, I'm sure he spoke to him other times, but 
Uh, we see, you might see, think that's weird, kind of strange, but we still see this today. Some of the, many of our Muslim friends in particular come to faith in Christ through dreams. Abraham Sarkar, who's a member of our church, comes to Christ many times for the first time they hear of Jesus in a dream. And then they seek him out. But look at what happens here. Joseph is called son of David. He's God, look at this, so graciously, reminding him of his identity. Joseph is being invited into the big story. This is no small clue as to what's going on here. So Joseph is trying to put all the pieces together. The Messiah would come through the house of David. And he's saying, Joseph, remember who you are. And remember whose you are. You have royal blood running through your veins. Let me remind you, now I'm inviting you into this big story. Look at verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, which means God saves. Another clue. He will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. This is Isaiah 7, verse 14, literally quoting, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And here the dawn rises on the righteous and the light comes on for Joseph and he realized what God is doing. And it's what he's doing for all of us. Listen, he's inviting you into the big story. He's inviting each of us away from this little story that we're ten- we tend to run to our little temporal stories, weak, feeble stories into the big story of redemption. And to find our place in what he's doing in and through us, which can be as simple as reaching out to others and loving people like Jesus, inviting someone to church. Joseph decides he's all in. He's a just man. And he, in his love for, for uh, Mary allows his mercy to triumph over justice. And he figures out a way as the Lord speaks into his life. We can do the same. We can recommit ourselves. What a good time to recommit ourselves to our friends to be people of influence, of integrity like Joseph, to to commit ourselves anew to marital and and familial commitments that we've made, to our friends and our families, to love one another freely. But what I want you to see is, I think the most important aspect of this entire message. I want you to see how Christmas reminds us, as we will take of the Lord's Supper here in just a moment, that God has rescued us from the great dilemma. We have a bigger dilemma than choosing which majesty of Christmas to come to this afternoon. You and I are caught between God's holiness and our sin. We are in a dilemma that we cannot resolve. And God is holy and just. And so there's got to be a way. How are we going to be rescued from our sin? The most important part of this message For every person here, hearing my voice. Listen, what we see is God steps in. He invites us into a relationship with himself. The whole arc of redemptive history, think about it with me. God enters into a betrothal, if you will. Mary and Joseph are simply uh, coming after, like all the rest of us, after Adam and Eve, who are married, if you will, in the garden, perfect relationship with God, in covenant agreement, they turn away from him. They, they, they run from God and sin, and the fall takes place. God enters back in, and through Abraham, he says, no, I want to enter into a covenant relationship with you. Let's get married. And then the law comes with a lot of marriage wedding language around covenant agreement with God. When we turn away from him, it's called spiritual adultery. And in books like Hosea, we see God continues to pursue us even in our sin. And then he does what we could never do. God comes in the person of Jesus, figures out a way to resolve the dilemma. And on the cross, God's unshakable holiness and his inflexible love collide and redemption is made possible for you and for me. God has made a way and it comes through faith and not works. And so instead of our being impaled by one side of this dilemma, 
Christ comes. He's impaled for us. And our salvation is made possible. If only you will believe. And so what I want us to do is close our time by partaking of the Lord's Supper. But I want us to pray. And I want you to just close your eyes with me right now. And I want, I want you to just come before the Lord. And just confess your need for him now. Thank him for entering into this great dilemma that has resolved every other dilemma in our lives, that we can live with grace and truth as Jesus showed us. Praise him that he's coming back for his bride. And Revelation 19, 7 says, that we'll spend eternity with him. We will celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb. Have you received His grace? You can do so now. Praise Him that He has died on the cross for you. Say thank you to Him. And by faith receive and believe. Lord, thank you for giving your life for us. And we thank you that you love us and you've made a way through the costly gift of your body and your blood shed for us. In Jesus' name, amen.